and gentlemen, available on all platforms and YouTube. He's the Apex Podcaster. He's the wise owl of professional wrestling. He smells better than dude love with Sex Panther on. He's the king of fantasy booking. He is your favorite podcaster's favorite podcast. He is Omega Luke, and you're listening to the Omega Luke Wrestling Podcast. Hey guys, I am indeed Omega Luke. Welcome to the Omega Luke Wrestling Podcast. Today I have a fantastic interview and I'm really excited about this because about two months ago I came across a new company on Twitter. Their name is Warrior Wrestling. Um, Absolutely stunning, like gorgeous, really nice appealing look to them. Very sleek, very smooth and I looked at the card that they produced and my word, insane wrestling card, like the ultimate indie show um, that you would want to go see, like some incredible names, Pentagon, Brian Cage, Tessa Blanchard, Jordan Grace, all these phenomenal names and I really wanted to get these these guys on my show. So I reached out to a wrestler, Darby Allen, um, big shout out to Darby Allen, who I seen was on one of these shows and sort of said, hey, you know, how do I get hold of these guys and they sort of said the guy who runs the company also runs their twitter page and just dropped them a message by the way i think he is also the principal of the school that the that the show runs on and i thought no way that can't be true so i i I know it sounds bad but i just didn't believe darby allen i thought he must have got that wrong somewhere just a principal really having a indie show at his school just doesn't sound um real to me so i reached out and it turns out darby allen was not lying it was completely true um so today i'm bringing to you steve from warrior wrestling principal of the school um that the show's a run at and owner of the company the company is less than a year old and it is already taking huge names um to their shows so it's such a great interview, by the way. Um, you're really going to enjoy it. Um, you're really going to love Steve too. He's fantastic. Um, if you haven't already yet checked out Monday's episode, the final Sunday's episode, even the final of the Fantasy Booking League, uh, Mason Adams versus Royley Rumbled, make sure you go and check um, that one out. Andrade Cien Almas was their stipulation. And I have finally crowned my first champion, which I will not spoil. Obviously, I'll let you guys watch it who haven't already. But enough of me. Let's find out more about Warrior Wrestling. Let's go straight over to Steve and myself and talk more Warrior Wrestling. Hey, guys. I am being joined today by the owner of Chicago-based wrestling company, Steve of Warrior Wrestling. Steve, thank you very much for joining me today, sir. Thank you very much for having me. I'm thrilled to be on the podcast and thrilled to be able to share a little bit about Warrior Wrestling with all your listeners. Definitely. Now, you <laughs> may have noticed I called Steve Sir. Now, that is because <laughs> Steve has two very different jobs and very unique story to for his company. So you have the most incredible orange, origin story, and you've already <laughs> mentioned it to me already, uh, the beginnings of the company. Um, sure. Why don't you ex- sort of explain to the listeners um, how it be- how it was created, uh, what it was quite like for you, and sort of explain the detail for people watching and listening at home just about the company itself. Sure, I'd be happy to. So my day job, my, my actual career is uh, I'm an educator. I'm a longtime high school teacher and currently serve as the principal of Marion Catholic High School in Chicago Heights, Illinois. And that's actually where I went to school as well. So I went to Marion, went to college, taught in California for a few years, came back to Marion, taught for several years, and then became the principal teacher or the the head of school uh, for Marion Catholic. And I've always been a lifelong wrestling fan. I can talk for hours about my journey in professional wrestling, and I I trained for a while. I dabbled in a lot of different things, loved wrestling. And our school, while it's a Catholic school, a private school, uh, we serve an area where a lot of our kids come from socioeconomically uh, underprivileged backgrounds. So a lot of our kids actually need quite a bit of tuition assistance or financial aid to be able to come to our school. 
A lot of times people think, oh, you're a private school in the United States. That means all your clientele are wealthy. Not the case at all. About three quarters of our kids need financial assistance to come to our school. And so our school does a variety of different things like golf outings and fundraisers and things like that to make money to help kids pay for tuition. Well, being a wrestling fan that I am and, and being an absolute nerd about wrestling, and I thought for several years ahead of 2018 about starting a wrestling promotion, I pitched to my boss, the president of the school, what if we ran professional wrestling shows at the school? I said, hear me out. I actually, I asked him, I said, would you give me a half an hour of your time to pitch you a crazy idea? And I promise you it'll be worth your time if nothing else for a laugh. And he said, great, I'll give you a half an hour. And I put together a whole PowerPoint presentation about independent wrestling and what it is and how it could fit in with our school and how it could raise money. And it was a 22 slide PowerPoint. And by slide four, he stopped me and he went, I'm in, I'm sold, let's do it. So awesome. my boss was very light to put together a wrestling show. The first, first one was May of 2018. And um, we were off to the races. It went really well. Uh, the quality of the show was very strong. We were very proud of it. It made a lot of money for the school. And we've got the green light to keep doing it ever since. That is pretty special. <laughs> so is the president of the school a wrestling fan as well, or is it? No, he had no, knows nothing about wrestling, and he'll be the first one to tell you that. And he's been at all three of our shows so far, and he goes backstage to meet the wrestlers, and he you know, works the welcome table out in the lobby, and he just tells me all the time how floored he is by the world of professional wrestling because he knows nothing about it, and he was very open-minded. He didn't come in with preconceived notions or with a condescending air. He just wanted to learn. And after the first show, we were debriefing, and he told me, you know, Steve, I can't believe just how normal it all is. Everyone's yeah. just people. This is just their job. Everyone's nice. Everyone's polite. It's just like us at the school. And so he has gotten the bug a little bit, and he's learning more and more every show. That's pretty special. He's <laughs> almost like created a fan from yes. this now. Then really, um, for for your president, and what better person really to create a fan of as the president of your school that you're holding and hosting the shows at? Yep. Um, very cool. How, like I said, the, the origin story of it is is absolutely awesome anyway but very cool um company itself i remember the first thing i seen was a brian cage photo um because i follow brian cage on on twitter sure. and that's how i sort of seen why wrestling i'm going to chuck that image up in a second um yeah. when i get to a more relevant time for people who are watching on youtube but um when did this begin um for warrior wrestling so I was exploring the idea of launching a promotion on my own, separate from the school, just as a, as a passion project for myself, throughout 2017. And I had put together a lot of different ideas, and, and I'm a huge frequenter of indie wrestling shows all the time. So I'm always looking at what works, who's incredibly talented. I, you know, I'm reading The Observer, reading The Torch, reading everything online. And in 2017, I decided I'm going to launch a wrestling promotion. And one of my best friends in the fall of 17 sat me down and basically said, look, you don't care about making a dime off of this, do you? I was like, no, I just want to do it. And he said, why don't you do it at the school? Because I had looked, I had met with a couple of local towns and cities about trying to pair with towns and cities and host it in the Civic Center or the VFW Hall in a town and try to get sponsors and things. And I got some nibbles, but not a ton of interest. And my, one of my best buddies, Eric, said, you got to do it at the school because you don't care about making money. You give all the money to the school. And the school's got the facilities, the locker rooms, the arena, the catering, the security, the parking. And it can all be kind of like a school function. And so he convinced me around November of 2017, like, you got to do it at the school. And it took me about a month to work up the gall to ask my boss, Vince, the president, uh, if I could sit down with him and pitch him the idea. That was Christmas break of 2017. He said yes. So basically New Year's Day of 2018, this past year, we hit the ground running, looking for talent and trying to make it make it a reality. That's pretty amazing. Uh, Did you have much help from students at all, from you know other other wrestling fans that maybe involved in the school? You know, a, a small handful of like merry misfits. Yeah. So our, uh, our one of our great vi our video guru in the school. He teaches video production classes. He does all the videos for our school marketing wise. Huge wrestling fan his whole life. Oh, so so I recruited him instantly, and he was the one that made all of our initial graphics, did all of the initial filming and video for our first show. So he and I are like two peas in a pod. And we do have, we have a core group of students who are just all about wrestling. So we've got about 1,000 kids in the school, and I'd say really there's about a dozen who, when we announced this, thought I was God. Yeah. Because they were, How does, <laughs> what are we doing? How is this happening? And the other 950-something kids are just like, no, okay, we're doing a wrestling show. So for the kids that really care, this is the coolest thing that ever happened. And for the rest of the kids, it was just something else we're doing at school. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I, you've probably created some fans through it as well of of the yeah. skill as well through through students just thinking, oh, I'll give it a shot, see what it's like, going along, yeah. thoroughly enjoying it. We had a bunch of kids volunteer to help at the last show, so they were in the fan fest, directing traffic, answering questions, helping people in the bathroom, etc. And after that, the fan fest was over. We said, well, come on in and watch the show for free. And I went and talked to the kids at the end of the night, and they were floored. Most yeah. of whom had never yeah. seen any wrestling before. There's one girl who I taught who's a senior. She's a riot. And she was standing on the bleachers screaming, yelling at wrestlers. And she came up to me afterwards and said, why didn't you tell me about wrestling when I was a freshman? I was like, I didn't realize you would have loved it so much. So That's amazing. <laughs> Are there many similarities yeah. between being the, the principal of a school and, and running a wrestling company? Is that very similar? Yes, actually. And, and I really think... And not, and not to pat myself on the back because there's a lot of missteps we've made and things we've learned and things we've got to do better. But I think it has run as smoothly as it has because my day job is dealing with chaos all day, 12 hours a day, all year long. Yeah. So yeah. it's teachers and students and parents and buses breaking down and, and all of every day is 100 fires to put out. And that's exactly what running a wrestling show is. Yeah. Somebody's flight yeah. is late. Somebody was supposed to work with so-and-so, but now they're mad at each other and don't want to work together. Something happened at the merch table. Somebody's mad about their seat. It's basically what I do for a living, but just switching from education to wrestling. Yeah, I, I can understand that, definitely. So in terms of your job role within the wrestling company itself, how much involvement do you have in the shows? Do you book the talent, book the shows, how they happen? Like, what 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 involvement do you have? Great question. I am a lot of it. And a lot of that because it is kind of my passion project, my baby. So literally before we came on today to record, I was on Expedia booking flights for a dozen different wrestlers, figuring out where they're coming from, where they're going to, travel preferences, who's got Delta miles, who's got American miles. So something is down in the weeds as you know, booking flights, booking hotels, but then also laying out the show itself. And so I've got a core group, Michael, who I mentioned earlier, our video guy, uh, my right-hand man, Eric, the guy that convinced me to, to do it in the first place and pitch it to the school. Uh, Michael, Eric, there's a few other guys in the group that we do the creative together. I, I do a good deal of the creative, but we, we sit down and we pitch a lot of ideas back and forth. What if we paired so-and-so with so-and-so? And then once we've got the matches, how do we want the show to flow? My buddy Eric that I mentioned a couple times, he and I actually ran for a decade a sketch and improv comedy company together. So we've been putting together shows really since we were starting when we were in our teens into our late 20s. And so regularly we'd lay out um, comedy sketches, improv games, what do we put in act one, what do we put in act two, and why, what's going to get over, what isn't going to get over, and then switching from that to wrestling was just like educational wrestling, I think comedy to wrestling was an even cleaner jump, because it's really the same thing, yeah. it's booking yeah. out different uh, ways to interact, laying out a show, is act one too long, is act two too long, so really Eric and I go back and forth and do the majority of the creative. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Um, you obviously run a school and a wrestling company. Have you ever thought about combining those areas together, create yourself a wrestling school and or a dojo, if you will, and and for aspiring wrestlers? You know, it's funny you ask, you say that. Um, a lot of people ask. I get a lot of Facebook messages and Twitter messages with people asking, "Do you train people? Can we train?" And I usually refer them to some of the really good schools in Chicago. So if you're familiar with Pro Wrestling Tees, the store that does all the, the T-shirts for the wrestlers, yeah, gotcha. they actually have – oh, they're, they're incredible. In their back warehouse, they have just opened a wrestling training school. And it's run by the guys who do freelance wrestling, which is one of the great indie groups here in Chicago. So as people ask us, I refer them to the experts there. And, um, and a lot of people have asked, will you start a school? Probably not because they're such a good program and – I'm busy with my day job. <laughs> yeah, well, you got a lot on your plate already. What was the inspiration of Warrior Wrestling then? Is there another company that you, you loved and tried to emulate? Because you said how you're quite a fan of indie wrestling yourself. Sure. Is there a style of indie wrestling? Because there's so much choice out there right now. Is there a style that you sort of are similar to in a way? That is a great question. So I think we, we try to do like a smorgasbord or a buffet approach and take a little bit of what we loved from all the different indies. So, for example, uh, PWG in Los Angeles. When I lived in Los Angeles for two years, I went to PWG all the time. And this is going to sound super hipster, but like I went to PWG before it was cool, yeah. uh, like before yeah. it was a national phenomenon, and then after it was a national phenomenon as well. And so what I always loved about PWG was that every match on the show could be a main event. And Dave Meltzer has mentioned this many times in The Observer. A lot of times when you lay out a wrestling show, the way you want the matches to flow and how you want them to progress and how – far you want guys to push it should follow an ebb and a flow but pwg doesn't they just basically put on eight main events 
in a night. And it works really, really well. So we always wanted to replicate that. We wanted our show, any, any match on our show could be hopefully a main event anywhere. So we wanted that PWG style. We also wanted the PWG AAW Defy vibe of cutting edge indie wrestling. We did not want to rely solely on legends and solely on names. We wanted to break guys that you haven't seen before and then maybe the first time you see them is coming to or watching our show streaming. But we, we didn't want to be so cool and hipster that we're against using big names. So, we, so yeah. our first couple of shows, I mean, we had Alberto Del Rio, Jack Swagger, uh, Ricardo Rodriguez, Hornswoggle, Ray Mysterio was on our second show. We were actually his last indie, his last date of any kind before he went back to WWE, which we really appreciate from Ray. Um, so the goal was at first use some big names to draw the eyeballs, get them there, and then introduce the audience to some cutting edge modern right now indie wrestlers. So a little PWG, a little AAW, a little Defy, um, just kind of all rolled into one. A little freelance. A lot of people don't know about freelance. They're a local Chicago indie. They do great long-term storytelling. So trying to pick a little bit from all those different and then put our own spin on it as well. Definitely. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned the, the PWG and having a main event because I want to take you to that first show, which you slightly mentioned a few names for then. Sure. On that card, Ellsworth versus Hornswoggle. Nick Aldis defending the NWA belt. I mean, Pentagon mm -hmm. Jr., Seidel, uh, Tessa Blanchard, Brian Cage versus Eddie Edwards. And the main event, like you mentioned, was Jack Swagger versus Del Rio. That was headlining WWE pay-per-views, like, you know, about eight years yeah. ago. Probably not even that. How the hell did you set up that insane <laughs> card as your first show? Because that must have been, as an indie wrestling fan yourself, like a pinch me moment. Like, I can't believe this is my show having these names here. Yes, absolutely. In fact, a lot of the, the local podcast guys in Chicago, some contacted me at first thinking it was fake because I guess there had been some shows in the past where people advertised names they didn't have. And we had people reach out and say, there's no way this is real. Like, why are you false advertising all these people? It's like, I swear they're coming. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of the credit goes to, to my boss, the president of the school, Vince, because when, when I pitched it to him and we talked about, well, how would we do this? I, I really pitched that we need to spend money to make money. If we're going to do yeah. it, we've got to do it well. And, and no offense to DIY small indies. God bless them. I love them. I've frequented them for forever. But our goal for the school was to, to make this a big deal and make a lot of money for scholarships for kids. Mm. And if we just had Mike the mechanic from down the street versus Dave the history teacher in the main event, it would draw a small amount of people. But we could charge a certain amount for tickets. And so I was able to convince Vince, let us spend a good deal of money – to pull a lot of people in, get a product rolling, and then we can kind of cut back on the budget as we go. But that first show, we needed to spend money to get on the map. And he believed in that, and we did it, and it worked really, really well. So not everybody is as blessed as I was. I was very lucky in that my day job absorbed this project and could budget for it. Uh, obviously, if you're just starting in India by yourself and you're just using your savings, you can't do that. So I understand that I'm blessed and lucky. And don't claim to be otherwise. But that was our thinking. Spend money to make money. Well, you, 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 you've got that opportunity and I feel, yes, you were lucky that you had the opportunity, but it, it takes some doing actually making that opportunity work. And what you clearly have done has, is put Warrior Wrestling and really your school on the map because the school is the venue of these shows. Yeah. So, you know, if, if me all the way in Plymouth in the UK, you know, I'm, I, I do like indie wrestling. I love indie wrestling. But I don't know every indie wrestling show in America. There are, there are so many. But I found your indie wrestling show. And as soon as I seen it, I was instantly intrigued. And the way that um, I originally wanted to speak to you anyway, because one, I really liked the look of um, Warrior Wrestling, like the logo, the brand, everything. I found it just very gorgeous to look at, like the logo and everything. Thank but you. then two... Um, I seen the card that you were putting on and the wrestlers that you were putting on. I thought, my God, like this is an incredible <laughs> show. So that's why I wanted to speak to you. And then I spoke to Darby Allen in an interview, which you guys um, listening probably have listened to. And if you haven't, it's on the podcast, it's on the YouTube. He goes very in depth about a lot of things. He shoots on a lot of people, um, mm. including Tessa Blanchard. So <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty insane. But he mentioned, I asked him after I noticed that he was on one of your shows and mm -hmm. I said to him, oh, do you know if the guy who runs Warrior Wrestling 
also runs the Twitter page because uh, I'm been meaning to DM him, but I don't want to DM him and be like a marketing guy and, and never get anywhere. I want to I want to speak to you know the people running these shows. And he said to me, well, I'm pretty sure the guy runs the, the show, but he also is the principal of the school. And then I thought, <laughs> oh my God, I've got to get this guy on because what an incredible <laughs> story. Um, so, you know, the fact that you've done that in less than a year, because your first show, like you said, was in 2018, the, the brand itself, the company isn't really even a year old yet. Um, so that's, that's pretty incredible. So when you started off this company, did you ever think that you could create a wrestling card as appealing to this show, but how the event went, tell us how it event, how it went, were there any many students from the school there the first time? Was it hard to get them involved? Um, sure. Maybe helping you as ring crew and, and that sort of thing. Sure. So um, the first, the first one back in May of 2018, um, for the most part, there was support from the school, both students and staff. There are a couple of staff members who rolled their eyes and thought, oh, this isn't appropriate or we shouldn't be doing this. But we set out from the very beginning to have a very family-friendly show, and so it's not going to be Attitude Era, et cetera. And so we, that was part of the pitch from the, from the beginning. So we had um, a handful of kids volunteer and help. Probably a couple dozen kids came to the show, bought tickets. Uh, but I had probably maybe a dozen staff members help as well, and then five or six other staff members who just came to support it. And everyone who was involved, kids and staff, just glowed about it. And most of them said something to the effect of, I came just to come to help or just to be there. And I walked away going, this was really cool. And yeah. Yeah. You mentioned earlier, creating new fans, it's always amazing to be able to take something that you love and show it to new people and to get them to maybe not love it to the level that you do because like I'm nuts, but to love it and appreciate it and, and for what it is and no longer judge it or if they came in with an open mind, being satisfied with what they saw. That first show, a, a little bit of staff, a little bit of students, but that first show was crazy. Uh, as far as it was the first time we had done it, you know, we flew in, I think, 19 different wrestlers for that show. So we're coordinating, setting up the gym, setting up chairs, getting the ring guys in the ring, getting the light guys there, getting all the food, getting the wrestlers from the airport, doing the fan fest. There's problems with the ticket check-in. And there's just so much that you learn that you get better little by little by little. So the third show, I thought, ran incredibly smoothly, so much so that we were walking around literally knocking on wood like that something didn't go terribly wrong. But the first show was hectic. I actually only probably watched maybe 20 minutes collective of the entire show that night, poking my head through the curtain, because we were in the back trying to figure out 100 different things. By the third show, I probably watched half the show from in the arena, and I kind of felt bad about it. I was like, is there something I should be doing? Because that first show, I was always putting out a fire, and the third show, it's like, well, I'll just go watch a match. So you get better at it, and it gets smoother and smoother as you go, but the first show was nuts. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, second show now. Yeah. The the most creative way to crown a champion I've ever seen, I think. Thank um, you. Tell us about the War of Attrition matches which led to crowning your first champion. I So I actually had this idea for a match in 2017. And uh, in my original idea, it would have been a two-day tournament where there were uh, kind of like qualifying matches in one day and then the match in the second day. But I, I had this idea of if you could bring eight people from all different types of wrestling, so different areas of the, of the world, different styles of wrestling, and do a match where one by one they're eliminated, essentially, down to one sole survivor. So it's a war of attrition. Whoever can take the most punishment and last through this thing. And so I came up with this idea in 2017. It's four on four. It's, it's, a, team, it's a tag team match, four on four. Losing team is eliminated. Winning team splits into two tag teams with the, the winner of the pinfall getting to pick his partner. The tag teams face off. Losing tag team is eliminated. The winning tag team faces off one-on-one, -on -one and that guy becomes the champion. So there's some strategy involved, too. You want to pick somebody as your partner who's going to help you win the second fall, but then you've got to face him in the third fall. So I came up with all this in 2017. And when we were laying out Warrior 2, we had a bunch of guys booked and didn't have anything we were playing with different match combinations. We didn't really like what we had. And I pitched to my group of guys. I was like, hey, I had this idea last year. What do you think? And all of them were like, you've been sitting on that for a year? I was like, mm -hmm. so they, they all liked it. And so we, we pitched it to a few of the wrestlers. The wrestlers liked it. And we put it together. And I spent maybe the first two weeks after we announced it worried that I had subconsciously stole it from somewhere. Like, I would never do that consciously or purposefully. But I was like, I probably saw this somewhere and it seeped into my brain. And as we went along... <laughs> I don't think so. I think we invented it. And we were we were really happy with how it turned out. Brian Cage loved it. He's always raving about it. So that, that I think that works pretty well because he's our guy. He's our champ. And he was happy to be in it. But we thought it worked really, really well. The combinations of guys worked well. It was an exciting match. And by the end, 
you know, the place went nuts. And that night was so hot. It was the day after All In. It was like 95 degrees in Chicago. We have no air conditioning in that gym. People were miserable and complaining at the start of the show. After that match hit, everybody was like, never mind. It was totally worth it. I lost 10 pounds, but it was worth it. Yeah, obviously, yeah. When, I, when I was looking through the card um, of the second show and seeing that, I thought, what an incredible way to crown a champion. Just the way it was, you go against your previous tag partner. It's so unique, which I thought was really special, which is why I wanted to bring it up. And I'm really glad that you 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 know you actually thought of it yourself, which is it makes the story even better, really. Um, speaking of that champion, Brian Cage, who I'm a massive fan of, by the way, he's absolutely incredible. Incredible, um, yeah. My first exposure to Warrior Wrestling, like I said, was the picture of Brian Cage and the championship. The belt, the logo that you have for Warrior Wrestling is simple and gorgeous anyway, but the championship belt is simply stunning. I'm a big fan of wrestling Thank belts you. anyway. Um, and this was different to any other, but it is gorgeous. So I'm going to I'm gonna quickly chuck up there for people um, on the YouTube so you can see it there. Um how incredible does it look on Brian Cage 2? Perfect as your first <laughs> champion. How does the designing go for, for a belt like that? So that was, it was a lot of me. Um, we, so when we were starting the company, we, we took a while to settle on a name. I wanted something that wasn't letters because so many, there's so many letters, there's alphabet soup. It's like uh, FDR's New Deal organizations from the depression. There's a million different three letter, letter combinations. We wanted something that was unique. And we kicked around a lot of cool names. We came with Warrior Wrestling. And we thought, all right, well, everybody's got to have that. There's got to be a Warrior Wrestling in every city. And we didn't really see any others. And we spent a couple weeks really searching the U.S. scene. Didn't see anybody else with Warrior Wrestling. So we, we settled on that name. And then for the logo, I literally spent endless hours, like an hour a night for weeks, looking through uh, different sites where artists create artwork for sale that you can buy logos and images and artwork. And I narrowed it down because I'm a huge nerd. This, I almost did a war of attrition for the logo. I narrowed it down to about <laughs> 12 or 15 of them that I put in a Word document. And I emailed that Word document to about a dozen of my friends. And I said, we're looking to pick a Warrior Wrestling logo. Here's all the ones we're thinking about. What do you think? And got a lot of input from different people, narrowed it down. And this one we thought was clean, sleek, cool looking. Um, if you like negative space in your logos, the top of the helmet is actually negative space W. We thought that was kind of cool, kind of like the Hartford Whale Whaler symbol. So we had the symbol, we had the logo, we had the name. When we knew we were doing a belt, I wanted to do the same thing that we'd done with some other things, which is I wanted it to be unique. So there's a million nice belts out there with a big round plate and a lot of small little plates, whatever. We loved our logo. And I said, I want the belt to just be the logo. So if you see that belt from 100 yards away, you know that's our belt. If you line up every other indie belts next to each other, you can't pick a single one out. But if you see ours from 100 yards, you know it's ours. And we were really happy with how it turned out. We went through a professional belt maker. It's real leather. It's real. It's not actual gold, but it's, you know, polished chrome or whatever it is. Looks it. But, yeah, but it looks pretty darn good. And, and like you said, it looks great on Cage. And there's a great picture of him holding up our belt and the Impact X Division belt That is together. the exact same that one which I've used. Picture. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're like really you happy said with as well, it. Like, you have got the, the 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 name of the company on the plate there, but you wouldn't yeah. need it necessarily. Like if you yep. if like you said, um, it is the logo. You can see on the picture there he has the Impact one. Um, if it didn't have Impact on it, you'd be like, who? What company is that? But it is your logo. It's it's perfect belt for your company. Um, your most recent show on the fifth of January, again in Chicago, the hotbed of wrestling at the yep. school, uh, had probably one of the best indie wrestling cards I've ever seen. So you had, the, you know, Lucha Bros, Pentagon and Phoenix, who mm -hmm. I think are just absolutely incredible. Um, Brian Cage versus Bandido, and what a year Bandido had. Uh, so yep. to go, he defended his title against Bandido. Rich Swan and Dragon Lee as well. But there's one match on there that I really want to speak to you about. Um, sure. I'm a big, big Progress fan. It's probably my favorite company right now. Jordan Grace defended her Progress Women's Championship at Warrior Wrestling in Chicago against Kylie Ray. How the hell did this come about, Steve? So we had, uh, so Kylie's a sensation in Chicago. Kylie wrestles for freelance and AAW, and she is unbelievably talented. The first time I saw Kylie, and I, I am very much a fan of presence in the room. So I don't care how good of a worker you are, if you have presence, you can't teach that. And Kylie, like Tessa, like a few others, has the immediate presence. And she's also a hell of a worker. And 
the first time I saw Kylie, I leaned over to who, whichever one of my buddies I was with, and I said, she is a better Bailey than Bailey. And that's not a knock on Bailey. I love Bailey. But Kylie is the most lovable, sweetest, truly as a human being as well. And she's a great worker. She's exciting. She's fun. And Jordan, we had her work Tessa at Warrior 2, and they just tore the place down. They had an intense 10-minute brawl, ended in a DQ. Tessa slapped a wrap. There was a big brawl. I had to pull them apart. And so we loved working with Jordan. And we thought, for me, anytime I lay a match out, I'm always thinking about styles, not just names, but how people work, how they move in the ring, what their move sets are, what might gel with what. And as we kicked around ideas, we thought Jordan and Kylie, that's going to be an incredible match. And so we booked the match, set it up, and then Jordan went on to win the Progress title. And she actually reached out to me that night. It was Jordan's idea. And Jordan connected me with Progress. And we thought, what if we made this a title defense? And so we set it up, and Progress was happy to do so. And um, the match itself was excellent, crisp, fast, hard-hitting. They matched together just the way we hoped they would. We were really, really happy with that match. Yeah, you can actually watch that match um, on the Progress Demand Network, which is how I knew about it originally because I went on to watch um, the latest show on the weekend and then it came up Warrior Wrestling and I was like, oh my God, I'm about to interview that guy. (laughs) I was like, so (laughs) clicked on that match and watched it. And it was, like you said, an insane match. But how important is it to have these associations with other companies? I suppose, really, because obviously it was Jordan's idea and she reached out to Progress. I bet you really couldn't believe your luck um, oh. with Progress, like a huge company right now, one of the hotbeds of British wrestling. Um, how, how important is it to have the associations with, with companies like that for your own brand to grow? I think it's absolutely vital. And so over our three shows we've already had, we've had uh, Zello Pro, which is a local Midwest uh, federation, defend their title on our show. Black Label Pro, which uh, was uh, out of Crown Point, Indiana, defended their title. We worked with a lot of Impact stars, actually worked with Impact to book some of their stars, worked with Progress on the, the title defense. I think there is, we are entering the age of collaboration in wrestling. And we're already in the age of collaboration. And I think this is an old Kennedy quote, a rising tide lifts all boats. You know, there's no reason for us to not use this star because they're in this federation or that star or for them to not use us to promote them. So progress, obviously known worldwide. I saw them when they came to Cicero, Illinois in November. The show was unbelievable. And uh, they're known worldwide. But you know what? They might not be known by some of the local families who come to our show. So hopefully it helps get some more eyeballs on them from across the pond. It helps us boost our um, cachet because we're associated with such a world-class organization and their titles being defended on our show. So it helps everybody. It's really a win-win. And I think you'll see more and more of that all throughout the world going forward because I don't think talent want to be stuck in one place, so to speak, as great as that place might be. And I think promotions win when everybody works together. So we're thrilled. And I can't say enough, you mentioned earlier, I can't say enough about how much we've fallen back asswards into good luck of people who are willing to help, willing to boost the show and, and do things like this. Yeah, definitely. Are there any other potential networking coming up um, in in the future shows that you are able to reveal yet? No, we're always working. We're always on the lookout. Um, you know, obviously a dream would be to work with uh, some of the guys from AEW. Um, you know, crossing fingers and, and sending out some some players and signals telling them we love to do that. I don't know what their plan will be going forward, but um, we're happy to work with anybody. I mean, really, you, you know what has really been cool about this journey this last year or so is that once we started it, people came out of the woodwork who love wrestling and just want to help. So like our mm-hmm. chief videographer, a guy named Rob Malinowski, who makes all of our documentary videos, he now does them for AAW as well and a few other people. Rob contacted me out of the blue last April and basically said, hey, I have a nine to five. I do wedding videos on the side. I've loved wrestling my entire life. Would it be okay if I came and made a documentary about your wrestling show? I said, absolutely. And so all of a sudden now he's making the promo videos for all these local independents around Chicago. And he's making, he's doing incredible work. And so Rob came out of the woodwork. Our ring announcer, Kirby, who does it for other indie federations, actually lives three blocks from the school. And he messaged me and said, um, you're starting a new federation down the block from me. And so Kirby's our ring announcer. And so people came out of the woodwork. And so not just other organizations, but individuals who want to help and want to be part of it. It's been really, really cool. No, that is pretty awesome. Um, what about the other way? If Progress or maybe Evolve, someone like that, contact you and say, look, we got Brian Cage on our card tonight, maybe against like Darby Allen or something, for instance. Yeah. 
what's the chances of making the Warrior Wrestling Championship on on our show? What would your reaction be to that? Absolutely, I'd be honored. Absolutely honored. Can't argue with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd be pretty buzzing if that was my show. Um, Patreon questions now. I, I have a couple of Patreons who who have some questions sure. for you, Steve. Courtney is the first one, uh, the lovely Courtney. What made you choose wrestling to be the way to support the school over other methods that um, is potentially available at your disposal, I suppose? Sure. Great question, Courtney. So we do, the school as itself does a whole lot of different fundraising um, events and things. So there's golf outings, galas, donations from people to an annual fund. Um, there, there's quite a bit that, that they do to, to fundraise. I'm not actually in the fundraising wing of the school. I'm in the education wing. So I do classes and teachers in education. Uh, this is just something that I'm deeply, deeply passionate about and thought it might be able to help the school. So I, I pitched it to my president who kind of oversees the fundraising wing of the school. And I said, hey, this is this is the fundraising neck of the woods business, but could I try this thing? And they gave me the blessing. So um, the school does quite a bit of other things as well. But for me, this was just a passion project. So I wouldn't put in 30 hours in the nights and weekends to work on a, a ballet show for the school. No offense to ballet. That's not where my passion is. Yeah. So for me, it was... Yeah combining passion with helping the school yeah i think um even from like my experiences of having this podcast and, and youtube channel like because i'm passionate about um wrestling and, and indie wrestling especially when i get like interviews such as yourself and, and other indie wrestlers i work damn hard in my own spare time um yep. because you just love it i like create i love to create graphics my wife calls it my 24 7 job um, yes because if if i'm not creating something or interviewing someone I'm tweeting about it and, and marketing it, which, you know, you wouldn't do if you wasn't passionate about it. So um, exactly. understand, understandably, as a huge wrestling fan, you're you're going to choose something like wrestling. Um, and it's, it's, it's paid off big time for you, definitely. Um, JPQ now is another question. And you sort of touched on this already, but I think he, wa- he wanted to know this personally. You have SEU at an upcoming show. Um mm-hmm. Could there be an appearance from Cody, Bucks, and Hangman? I would love nothing more than for that to happen. So as I mentioned earlier, I was an early PWG guy, and so I was watching the Young Bucks when they were only known in the American Legion Hall in Reseda, California. And they were the nicest guys in the world then, and they were tearing the building down then. So to see the Bucks rise to what they've risen to is just really personally satisfying for me. I don't know them. Like, we're not personally acquainted. I've just watched them for years. And to see two really nice human beings who care so deeply and work so hard and sacrifice so much rise to this level in their profession just makes me really happy. And it reinforces the good parts of the world. And so I would love for the Bucks to come by. I love Cody and Hangman as well, but the Bucks particularly because, you know, I I saw them when you could walk up to PWG and buy a ticket for $30 and it was just another indie um it reminds me almost of so i watched cm punk growing up in the local indies here in chicago and when punk beat cena at money in the bank in 2011 i was there and like you could have knocked me over with a feather i i I could have died the next day i was so happy to see that all come together so to answer his question i would love to have the bucks there i have no inside information and i'm not working i'm not kayfabing um i've told scu you're more than welcome to bring guests to the show and, uh, you know, Frankie responded with, uh, thanks for the heads up, but, um, I have no information. And, and from what I understand from defy and bar wrestling and NEW, I don't think those organizations really knew it was happening until the day before anyway, or, or even the morning of. So, um, if the bucks are listening, we'd love to have you, mm. um, <clears throat> shoot us an email, but uh, no, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But if, but, uh, if it did, I would be over the moon. Yeah, I suppose if they wouldn't know the day be- until the day before because a secret like that is best yeah. kept a secret because we've seen reactions at these indie shows where All Elite Wrestling are sort of um, coming out of nowhere, surprising the audience, and the reaction yeah. is incredible because it is a surprise. Yeah. Um, so definitely. So I want to talk about the future now for Warrior Wrestling. Sure. This next show that you have in a couple of months' time, um, mm-hmm. Are there any plans to sort of increase the amount of shows maybe in the future? Like what is the short-term goal for Warrior Wrestling? Great question. I think the equilibrium for us is going to be four shows a year. I think basically doing a show quarterly is doable from a logistics standpoint. As we talked about earlier, you know, I have a a nine to five that's a 70 hour a week, nine to five. And then I've got a 20 hour a week, midnight to two job that I love, uh, which is putting together these shows. So, um, 
I think feasibility wise, four years, probably pretty good. So we will do March 15th. We're also most likely going to do a May show as well, uh, not publicly finalized yet. Um, so this year will have been September, January, March, May. We'll most likely take the summer off just because school's not in session. So a lot of the people in logistics aren't there to host the show. It's also hot. Like I mentioned earlier, the school doesn't have air conditioning in that gym. So mm. a show in July in that gym is not a good idea. Uh, but most likely we'll do four a year. And we think that that gives us the ability to build storylines from show to show to show over the course of the year. But it also gives us the ability for each show to be a special event. And not that the indies that run monthly aren't great, but if we only do four a year, they're, they're very special. And it yeah. puts the pressure yeah. on us to make sure that we deliver the kind of card you talked about earlier. If I run every month, I can get away with saying, oh, well, you know, we'll fill that in with four undercard matches. If I run four times a year, the pressure's on me to make sure that every match is going to be incredible because it better live up to the last show. Definitely. Can't argue with that. Um, so the fourth show, who is on it? Maybe give us a bit of a briefing of any storylines going on in the show. I mentioned SCU earlier. Um, who, who, what's the rest of the card? What are we looking at to sort of tingle people's taste buds for it? Absolutely. And I can actually drop some news today as well about a couple other things that have just been booked, a couple other things that have changed. The one match that we've announced uh, will change a little bit because of some new people coming out of the card. So the, the, the top of the card is Brian Cage defending the Warrior Wrestling Championship against all three members of the Rascals, Desmond Xavier, Trey Miguel, Zachary Wentz. They may not be household names to some people listening. They're on impact. Yeah. They are yeah. an incredible trio of wrestlers. And if you watch the Brian Cage Bandito match, one of the incredible spots was Brian Cage monkey flipping Bandito literally from turnbuckle to turnbuckle. It was this incredible show of strength. And one of my friends has joked that, can you imagine what Brian Cage can do to the Rascals? Because they can fly and, and he can send people flying. So that'll be a fatal four-way first pin to win. We think that match is going to burn the house down. We've also got Jordan Grace, whom we talked about earlier, who's incredible, against Lisa Marie Varen. Lisa Marie was Victoria in WWE, Tara in TNA. Lisa Marie is a badass. She's been a badass for, for an 18-year career. And her and Jordan, we think, is going to be a slobber knocker of a women's match. Some women's matches are quick. Some women's matches have a lot of strikes. We think they're going to beat the snot out of each other. It's yeah. Pretty yeah. Good. The match that changed, the SCU match. So um, DJ Z, Andrew Everett, and Rich Swan are going to be sliding into some new challenges because as of last night, we received a major challenge for SCU that SCU has accepted. It will be a regional battle in the United States, Southern California versus Ohio, because it's SCU versus OVE. Sammy Callahan and Jake and Dave Christ. No First no time ever way. anywhere, SCU versus OVE, we think is going to be pretty darn incredible. Um, Sammy Guevara slides into a major featured singles match. We can now announce news today here. DJ Z is going to return to Warrior Wrestling and face Sammy Guevara. The two of them are old rivals and old friends, and if you know anything about their talent and the way they work and move in the ring, we think that might steal the show from the headliners. Yeah. yeah. Swan and, and Andrew Everett slide into a six-man scramble match. It's Swan, Everett, and four Chicago guys who are incredible. Isaiah Velasquez, Matt Nix, uh, Gringo Loco, and Bryce Benjamin. That match most likely will open the show, and it will set a high bar for anything else to follow. We've also got Kylie Ray and Britt Baker. Britt, one of Kylie's idols, legitimately, that's a shoot. And uh, Kylie gets to wrestle her for the first time ever anywhere. We've also got Eddie Edwards and Austin Aries once again. They had a fight at Warrior Wrestling 3. No rules. And it was garbage cans, kendo sticks, bananas, guardrails, uh, everything you can imagine. Aries ended up bloody. And Eddie won it with a the horns of Aries or the last chancellery with a kendo stick on Austin Aries. Well, Aries reached out after the show and said, Eddie Edwards is basically a garbage wrestler, a glorified old Tommy Dreamer. He could never beat me in a, an actual wrestling match. <laughs> so that is what we have set up, a pure wrestling match, Eddie Edwards and Austin Aries. And if anybody followed Eddie during his Ring of Honor career or early in his Impact career before he switched over to brawling, Eddie's an incredible technical wrestler. Yeah. So this yeah. match, you know, um, I think the, the moment we announced it, somebody put on Twitter, this will own and I agree, that match is going to own. Um, L.A. Park, legendary luchador La Parca, L.A. Park, is coming to Warrior Wrestling, taking on Sam Adonis, our resident Rudo. Sam has been on every show, and Sam is incredible, and that match is going to be a brawl most likely as well. Um, Moose from Impact Wrestling is taking on Wardlow, guy out of Pittsburgh who's incredible. 
if there's a guy that you haven't heard of that you want an early tip on, it's Wardlow. He goes by Wardlow. And so his last name, the man with war in his name, he is built like Moose, and he can move, he can fly, he can wrestle. This guy's impressive. Uh, we also have another breaking match to share right now for the first time ever anywhere. We just confirmed it three hours ago with the last participant. We have booked the most ridiculous professional wrestling match ever. It is a six-man tag. Ethan Page and the Space Pirates, Space Monkey and Shane Sabre, versus Hornswoggle, Congo Kong, and Jungle Boy. No way. <laughs> yes. So Ethan Page finds himself the, the odd man out surrounded by characters in a big six-man tag. If people don't know Jungle Boy yet, he just signed with AEW. Uh, his name is Jack Perry, son of actor Luke Perry. He is an incredible up-and-coming wrestler. Congo Kong insane. from Impact fame. Um, Congo Kong and Jungle Boy on the same team is two lost people come to civilization. So that's going to be pretty cool. Hornswoggle returns to Warrior Wrestling. He was on Warrior 1, just had a giant cameo in the Royal Rumble, hiding out under the ring. The and Vega. Him him back. Yep, scaring off Selena Vega. So that's going to be pretty incredible. And um, the last thing, I think, on the card, so that's a, it's a, it's a jam-packed card. It's basically an overstuffed burrito of wrestling. There's 11 matches, which Jesus. are cards. <laughs> I know. Every, so our first show had 10 matches, and everyone's like, it's too long. The audience won't be with us. And we're like, we're sorry, we're sorry. And we got to the end, and the audience was white hot, and some of the wrestlers were like, nope, never mind. It's fine. Uh, our second card had eight matches, but one of them was War of Attrition, so basically had 10 matches. Third card had nine matches. This one has 11 which, again, it's probably too much, but how do we say no to any of these main event level matches yeah. that we have? Yeah. Um, the last intrigue, and this isn't even a match, is that we know some... Or no, actually, there's two more. The last match is um, the ego Robert Anthony, former WWE um, developmental guy who's incredible and a, a staple in the, in the Chicago scene with Frank the Clown, his manager, Noel Bo uh, Foley's boyfriend from, from Holy Foley, and them against Brian Pillman Jr., if you've never seen Brian Pillman, he's incredible. Spitting image of his father, yeah. incredible yeah. athlete. That guy, I talked earlier about presence. The guy has presence. So we did this match called the Free For All at Warrior 3, which started with Pillman and Ego, ended with Pillman and Ego, and Ego won by cheating uh, with the help of Frank the Clown. So now they've got a one-on-one, -on -one, and I know Pillman wants to get his hands in the clown as well. So that's the last match. And the last wrinkle is Pat Monix, local wrestler, working his way up, really good guy. He's been in the, the midst of a feud with Sam Adonis. Sam's team beat his team at Warrior 3. We do not have Pat in a match, but we have been told that Pat will be making his presence felt. So in some way, shape, or form, Project Monix continues at Warrior 4. So sorry that we're so long-winded, but I wanted to get all those matches out there, especially the new ones that I'm breaking right here on the podcast. Literally the first place I've told anyone, because one of them was just confirmed a couple hours ago. Absolutely insane. Well, I really appreciate you giving us the lowdown and the breaking news. What an insane card. Um, yeah. Definitely going to have to be checking that one out. What's what's the date for that one? Sorry, again. Friday, March 15th. So about Friday, six weeks from March 15th. And you've got your own, um, well, you're on a network where people can sort of watch it if you're not in the Chicago area as well. Is that, am I right? So we're part of the High Spots Network. Yeah. So High Spots has long time been a, a distributor of various wrestling products, and they've over the last couple of years dabbled with streaming. And they, they streamed Warrior 2 for the first time. They loved it. They've kept coming back. So it's High Spots Wrestling Network or High Spots WN on Twitter. They do a whole bunch of different indie shows that they stream and a lot of shoot interview shows and other fun shows that they make as well. So if you're not in the Chicago area, you can watch it live or on demand on the High Spots Wrestling Network. Well, I'm pretty well, sure I'm you'll have a lot of people checking out that show because that card is pretty sick. Um, what are your long-term goals? We talk about short-term goals. What are your long-term yeah. goals now for Warrior Wrestling? Do you, what, what do you want to see the company rise to become? You know what? It's funny. I am such a goal-oriented person, and I always have the end in mind. And with this, I don't really have a clear goal. And that, that sounds terrible, but it's, it's not like we're not striving and not wanting to do things long-term. But really, the first one was just, could we do this? Yeah. Could we pull yeah. it off and do it well and help the school? And then it was, well, could we do it again? And then three became, well, could we do it better? And then four has become, can we do it regularly? And the, the scene in wrestling is shifting so much right now internationally that no one knows what the landscape's going to look like in six months. But I know that we want to keep doing shows, keep building and getting better and better. We understand fully, and I think this might be the reality coming, is that a lot of the key pieces of the puzzle might come off the table as far as, as major players in that they'll get signed up by ROH or AEW or WWE or New Japan. 
So I think going forward, and every indie promotion is going through this right now, we've got to find out, all right, who's the next big thing? Who's the next yeah. Bandito? Yeah. Bandito can't do indies anymore. Who's the next Bandito? So I think long term, our goal will be, we always want to put on the best possible show with who's available to us, but we also want to be finding those guys who one day, you're like, what I said about earlier about the Young Bucks and PWG or CM Punk and the LWF, I want somebody to say, you know, I saw Wardlow at Warrior Wrestling before he signed with AEW and got into a feud with Cody. I want to be able to introduce the world to people, to, to cool wrestlers, and I want to give incredible wrestlers the platform. I can't tell you how many wrestlers have thanked us for giving them the platform, and we're like, thank you for coming to our high school. Um, so the long-term goal, I think, is keep putting on the best show possible of what's available to us and keep providing that space for great people to do what they do creatively. Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great goal. What an incredible goal. Um, I have a few quick fire questions now, if you don't mind, which would be quite Absolutely. funny. It's been great talking to you. Keep me as long as you'll have me. Definitely. It's been great having you on. What Number one, then, what is your favorite company other than Warrior? Great question. Right now. I, right now. Um, New Japan has been my favorite for the last several years. Yeah. And that's kind of the trendy thing to say, but it's the truth. They're, the matches are unbelievable. The long-term storytelling is unbelievable. The vibe and the energy is unbelievable. Um, so New Japan has been really incredible. Um, I also I went to All In, obviously, and, and it was absolutely outstanding. And so I, AEW hasn't launched yet, but I have so much faith in the Young Bucks that I can guarantee you on May 25th, they'll become my favorite company the moment that the graphic goes on the screen. Actually, we're going to try to go out and see it in Vegas. So the moment the, moment the lights come up, I think AEW will be my favorite company. Yeah, and you can't argue with the people that they're signing up. Like you said, Jungle Boy, obviously Jericho showing up. Um, they're taking the world by storm. And it looks like, I mean, I'm not one for speculation or anything, but since all these signings have been coming up in AEW and, and things like this, WWE have been having a lot of problems backstage. Now, yes. I'm, not, I'm not one to say it, point fingers and say it's because of AEW, but there is a very weird coincidence that that seems to be happening. We had, like, literally today, as we are recording this, um, Hideo Itami yep. um, looks like he's he's on his way out. So, Kenta, obviously, a huge name in Japan on the indie scene. Um, yep. Next question. Who's your favorite wrestler for Warrior? Oh, my gosh. Um, I'd have to say Brian Cage. And because... He'll beat you up if you don't. Yes. Well, hey, <laughs> no, he wouldn't. He's too nice. He's the <laughs> nicest person I've ever met. Oh, God. And, and so it kind of kills the aura of the gimmick. He's such a nice guy. But um, Cage is... So when we decided who was going to be the champion, when we laid out we were going to do War of Attrition, who are we going to put in it? We started with the end first. Who do we want winning this thing? And we kind of took an internal poll among all of our guys and asked some other wrestling fans, like, who do you think would be a good face of the company? And most, the vast majority said Brian Cage, and I was like, great, because that's what we were doing anyway. Yeah. Brian yeah. Cage is the quintessential performer. He is. He looks like something out of outer space. He looks like he landed from a planet of monsters. He is an incredible in-ring wrestler, power moves, reversals, chain wrestling, lucha flying. At Warrior 2, in the War of Attrition match, there's a spot when it's still the four-on-four. Four. Everybody ends up outside in the aisleway. Brian Cage hits a top rope plancha, hits the pile, rolls off of the pile, and then walks up the bleachers of the school, and the place goes insane. And my buddy Eric and I were in the arena for that moment, and we looked at each other, eyes wide open, jaws on the floor, and we both at the same time went, that's our champ. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's just capable of doing anything. He truly is. Nicest guy in the world, incredible professional. The, if you were to build a performer from the ground up, you'd build him. So my favorite wrestler, Brian Cage, period, end of story. Great answer. I, I think one of the times that I fell in love with Brian Cage was the Impact match. I think it was after Slammiversary when he was against Ray Phoenix in a singles match. Ray, C yep. Ray Phoenix did that suicide, suicide dive outside and he caught him and suplexed him in one movement, which was absolutely disgusting. I don't know how he'd done it. <laughs> but he's sort of like, if for anyone who doesn't know Brian Cage, one, like, where have you been? But two, he is like, he looks like Batista and has the strength of Batista, but he moves like Ricochet. Yes. Yes. That's, that is it, isn't it? It's, he is, is disgust he defies physics completely. Um, <laughs> the wrestler that you'd love to see in Warrior Ring the most that you haven't had yet. Oh, great question. Um, but the list is very small because you've had some incredible names already. Yeah. So 
I'm going to rule out anybody that's under contract because those they're just not yes. on the table. Right? Yeah. So WWE guys, uh, AEW guys, some of them, um, Ring of Honor guys, etc. Who is out there that we'd want that we haven't had? Um, I well, you know, I was good, I was going to say Roosh, but Roosh just signed with ROH, so he's off the table. I'd love to get Caristico, who was the former Sin Cara in WWE yep. and, and is kind of, kind of a big deal down in CMLL, one of their big stars. I'd love Caristico. Shane Strickland is a great wrestler That's in, in the U.S. Yeah. indie scene. Um, and, and a lot of the, the U.K. guys are off limits. Now they're officially off limits with WWE, even from U.K. And, and European independence. But for a while, they could have done European independence. I wanted Pete Dunne. Oh, I traded emails with Pete Dunne. You know, all right, so I'll give you two more, too. I've, I've gone back and forth with Will Ospreay and Zack Sabre. And Zack is a wonderful human and just busy and booked. Ospreay might be my number one, though. Sorry, I, I had to think that out loud no, with you. No, uh, fine, I think thanks. Osprey might be my number one. Osprey, like Cage, is a wrestler that can do anything. And Osprey started with crazy high spots, high flying. And in the last six months, he's put on weight and focused a lot more on psychology and wrestling. So I, I think Osprey versus Cage is a match of the year contender. Yeah. That is a match yeah. I would love to book. Will Osprey versus Brian Cage. 100%. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but Will Ospreay versus Volta um, in OTT. Oh. Now, that was pretty Look incredible. Out. Yeah, it was absolutely insane. Um, what has been your favorite match in a Warrior ring so far from any event? Excellent question. I would have to narrow it down to either the Lucha Brothers versus Team White Wolf from Warrior 3 or the War of Attrition match. Those two. And, and you know what? I would. I love the War of Attrition. Like we talked earlier, it was my baby. I would almost give the edge to the Lucha Brothers versus Team White Wolf because we took a chance on A-Kid. We saw the A-Kid Zack Sabre match, and we said, we need to get this guy. And uh, originally, it was going to be A-Kid and Matt Seidel versus uh, Phoenix and Pentagon because we had Seidel. We thought there would be a, a good chemistry there. Seidel got hurt, and so we brought in A-Kid's partner, Carlos Romo, from Team White Wolf. And they flew from Spain for this match. And it was incredible, and they killed it. And Eric's wife, Christina, actually texted us at the end of that match, and she's not a wrestling person at all. And she texted Eric and I. We were in the back. I don't know anything about wrestling, but that was totally badass. <laughs> and we're like, yep. Yeah, yes, it was. And it got a crazy standing ovation. So I would say my top two are War of Attrition and that tag team match. Luchas and White Wolf slightly nudge out War of Attrition. Oh, fair shout. Um, okay, you've accidentally put yourself in a tag match for Warrior against <laughs> brian cage who do you choose as your partner oh my god who can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with cage um i would have said walter but he's locked up now uh with wwe europe um and i just quiver in the corner I'd, I'd call i'd call osprey if i could get osprey in there and just uh let them tear it up and i'll hide in the under the ring yeah the corn's yeah. Good shout. Um, okay, if you could create your dream match at Warrior, you said Osprey versus Brian Cage already. Yep. Take that one aside. Is sure. there a match or a stipulation maybe you'd like to add as well? Singles, tag, ladder, anything like that. Create your perfect match. Wow. You have the best questions I've ever been asked. Um, War of Attrition was my first baby. We did one last year, last show called Free For All, which is kind of like a Royal Rumble meets an elimination chamber. So two guys start, every two minutes another guy comes out, and every two minutes the guy comes out, guy comes out, and you're eliminated by pinfall or submission. I really liked that match as well. Mm. Um, I would love – I like the unique things. I like trying to do something different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it would probably involve Cage, maybe Pentagon. I think Pentagon is one of those once-in-a-generation talents as well. Same thing with Phoenix. I mean, Phoenix is incredible. Pentagon as a character, just the, the, the presence in the room of change. So some type of multi-man match, again, with Cage, Phoenix, Pentagon, somebody, uh, if Cage is off the table, Phoenix and Pentagon, maybe versus SCU. We kicked around the idea of Phoenix and Pentagon and maybe with Ray Horace or Laredo Kid or Titan or Dragon Lee against SCU. I think that would be an incredible match. A yeah. lot of guys have yeah. personalities. So that would be a dream match. Um, I'd love to get A-Kid back and have him against Sabre in a rematch or A-Kid against Jonathan Gresham or A-Kid against uh, some of the other great Matt wrestlers. Uh, we had Dragon Lee at Warrior Wrestling 3, and he was unbelievable. So Dragon Lee versus Titan, or Dragon Lee versus a, a DJZ. Um, I like all the, the different styles. That's one of the things we try to do on the show is have lots of different styles. So there's not one style I like the best, but whatever style we're doing for that match, I want the best we can possibly get of that style. Yeah. So if it's going to yeah. be a chain wrestling match, I want A-Kid and, and Sabre, A-Kid and Jonathan Gresham. 
if we're going Lucha, I want Phoenix versus Dragon. You know, I want the best we can possibly do. Yeah, no, you can't argue with that. Um, okay, if you had to pick a dream venue outside of the school that you currently run in, where would you love to host a wrestling event? Great question. Um, so a while ago, Billy Corgan was part of a an indie here in Chicago called Resistance Pro. And he was with them for maybe a year or two as their creative guy. And they originally ran their shows in this building in Chicago that's changed hands 10 times and been 10 different things. It was a nightclub at the time called the Excalibur. And it, it's an old castle, literally an old castle in the middle of Chicago. And when it was a nightclub, it had an open dance floor and like several balconies up and down the walls. And they ran shows there and it looked like something out of Fight Club. It like looked like the vibe was cool and incredible. So I, a place, maybe not necessarily that venue, but a place where the venue has character. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. nothing wrong with running in a rec center. There's nothing wrong with running in a, in a flea market or a, you know, a, a state fairgrounds. But I want the place to, to feel something. I, I'd love to run in an old factory or an yeah. airplane yeah. or something. Like PWG's new venue is awesome. They run in an old theater in downtown Los Angeles. And it looks like a million bucks when you watch it. So I would want it to be a venue. I don't really care about the city. I don't really care about the size. But I want the place to feel special. Yeah, so you, you, you're, you're talking similar to like what Progress do as well, the electric ballroom. Yes, yes, the electric ballroom is amazing. Yeah, they even mentioned like how the electric ballroom had like bits of scaffolding up in the corner in their last show. Like they embraced that, which I yes. love about Progress. And I love how, you know, I gave you the option to pick any venue in the world. You could have had the Tokyo Dome. You could have had MSG. You went for very different, unique um, sort of yep. stuff, which I think says a lot about yourself and the company. So I think that is pretty incredible. Okay, last quick fire question. What do you awesome. find more rewarding, being a principal or being <laughs> a wrestling company owner? You know what? They're very different. And so one of my best friends who's been one of my best friends for forever, he and I were out to dinner a couple of weeks ago and he's like, well, I mean, you like being principal, but you love being a wrestling promoter. And that's true to an extent, but he never sees me and, and talks education with me. And so all of my teacher and education friends are like, I mean, you like the wrestling thing, but you really love being a principal. So they're... They're so completely different, and that, I hope that's not a cop-out answer, but I get a different pride from them. Um, and, and so I love working with kids, love working with teenagers. Like I, I have the honor of when our kids graduate, I shake their hands when they walk across the stage and hand them their diploma. And I can't put into words how proud that makes me, especially not for the kids who are incredible students or the kids who are you know big man on campus or whatever, but for the kids who struggled to get their way through school, whether it was with classes yeah. or personal demons or things like that. When I shake that kid's hand, I mean, I have, I've shaken a kid's hand on the stage of graduation and handed them a diploma, and we have both started to cry. Like, like that has happened to me two or three times in my career as principal. So I, 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 I love wrestling, but I don't love wrestling more than that. And I love teaching, but I also, when, when, the, when people come up to me and say, I didn't give this thing a chance, and then I came to your wrestling show, and I think it's the coolest thing in the world, that warms my heart as well. So I really think, and I actually had a friend point this out last week, because we had a party watching the Royal Rumble, and, and one of my friends pointed this out. When I was standing in the ring explaining the show and what it raises money for, and then I get to turn it over to one of our kids who sings the national anthem, that's the best moment for me, because it's all of those things come together. So I don't think I can pick one or the other, and I'm not trying to cop out on an answer, but they're both different sides of my personality, and I think they're both totally valid. No, I'll accept that, so that is pretty special to be honest you know you've you've mentioned all of that sort of stuff and i can completely agree with you to be fair and um, that would be a difficult choice steve i want to thank you massively for joining me today it's been awesome to find out more about warrior and the incredible story that you've created really um please tell the audience watching listening where you are to watch these shows live and and, and mention the online network that where people can find you again Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This was a really fun conversation. I would be happy to come back if you'd ever like me to, to come ahead of or after any Warrior shows. I'd love talking to you. This was, this was great. Um, so we are on Twitter at Warrior Wrestling. No vowels in wrestling, so W-R-S-T-L-N-G. Uh, we're on Facebook at Warrior Wrestling. Instagram, same thing as Twitter. Uh, the website is warriorwrestling.net, and on there you can find links to all of the online streaming as well as the cards, merchandise, etc., and uh, the streaming network is High Spots Wrestling Network. They're wonderful, great guys. Uh, 
they work actually so fun thing they do all of the mixing of the show it's our kids our students from our video classes are all the kids with the cameras so we have two or three kids ringside a kid on the hard cam so the kids are doing the actual filming the, the professionals from high spots are the ones mixing it and streaming it live to the internet so it's this great combination of wrestling world and, and education world so check us out on high spots check us out on the website and twitter and um really if you're all around the world listening please uh, pick a show watch it uh, i promise you it'll be worth your money definitely do you know what? I'm, I'm gonna go before, before i let you go and just say what i think would be pretty awesome is for these these students here are, are videoing and, and and doing all this thing for the wrestling when in a couple of years time when wire and wrestling is even bigger than what it is now and for these kids who are then going looking for, for real jobs and everything, and they, maybe they try and go for something in the in the recording world, photography world, maybe something like that. And they say, what past experiences do you have? You know, you've just come out of university and go, well, actually, I've been recording uh, Warrior Wrestling <laughs> for a few years now. I think that would be a pretty special um, thing for those, for those people and, and definitely um, something that will look very nice on their CV. Yeah, it'll be pretty unique too. It'll lead to definitely some interesting questions in the interview. Yeah, definitely. But thank you very much, Steve. Um, you already said how you'd like to come back on. I would love to have you back on. That was the thing I was going to say next um, after a show or something like that and, and really nail down the actual show itself instead of going over wire wrestling as a whole. So that that's definitely something we can arrange in the future. Let me know. I'd be happy to. Love talking to other people who are passionate about wrestling. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. You got it. Have a great day. And you.